Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. This is the ninth episode in a series that seeks to demystify programming in assembly language for the 6502 family of 8-bit processors. We're using the Commander X16 as a target as it has a 65CO2 and is a particularly excellent platform for this learning process. If you haven't seen the previous episodes and need to start at the very beginning, please go back to my channel. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell for notifications while you're there so that you'll know when the next episodes come out, and start this playlist from the beginning. So far in this series, we have learned the fundamentals of assembly programming by going through the entire 6.5 CO2 instruction set and examining how each instruction works and then how to do basic things with the kernel. In this episode, we are going to say hello to Vera, a special component that was created for the X16 that handles all the things that are no longer handled by current ships in production to be compatible with 8-bit systems. The most visible thing Vera does is, well, the video. So that's what we are going to learn about today, how to configure and update the display of the X16 by using the Vera directly. So what exactly is Vera? Well, it's short for Versatile Embedded Retro Adapter, and it's a daughter board that is mounted in parallel to the X16 motherboard and is connected to the 65CO2 data bus. It is based on a field programmable gate array, or FPGA, which is a chip that can be programmed to implement any digital circuit. This way, it could be designed specifically to work with the X16 and can provide all the missing components needed to complete this 8-bit dream computer. For the graphics, it puts out a 640x480, 256 color display signal at 60 Hz, which can be connected to a standard VGA monitor or an NTSC TV through either composite video or S-video connections. It even supports interlaced graphics through the VGA connector for certain vintage monitors. If you don't live in North America or Japan, the NTSC TV connections likely won't work with your TV's analog inputs, so you'll need to use a VGA monitor. But for now, anybody can use the emulator, so that's what we'll do, just as we have been for this series. The color palette uses 12-bit colors to define all 256 colors however you wish, and the display can be composed of layers containing bitmaps, tiles, text, and sprites. Beyond video, the Vera also provides an interface to an SD card, and two kinds of audio output, which will all be in a later video. Right now, let's get to the basics of how a program can interface with Vera. Let's take a look at the X16 memory map again. That orange segment starting at hex 9F00 is for hardware I.O., and the entire Vera interface is mapped to there. All that the CPU can access of the Vera directly is a set of 32 8-bit registers. Every change and update that you see is done by storing values to these registers. Vera has its own separate memory called VRAM, or Video Random Access Memory. This serves pretty much the same purpose as the VRAM in your modern computer's display adapter, but the Vera memory is structured in a way that makes it possible for an 8-bit computer to use it. VRAM has a 17-bit address space with two 8-bit data channels that can be connected to the X16 data bus. It also has two more 8-bit channels that are used for sound and the SD card, but that again is outside the scope of this video. Today, we are just going to be looking at how to access VRAM and deal with those 17-bit addresses. The first step for any VRAM access is to specify which data port you are using. This is done with the Vera control port at hex 9F25 by setting bit 0 to the desired port. This means that any address you store in the address registers will be for that port. If you flip that address selection bit, you can specify an entirely different address for the other port. As the addresses are 17 bits, they require three different registers to specify them. Bit 16 of the address must be written to bit 0 of hex 9F22, which is the address high register, or you could just call it the bank register, as that's how the bit is handled by the assembler. This register also lets you specify a stride value that updates the VRAM address for the port each time it is accessed by the data bus. The next two registers are for the lower 16 bits of the address. Once the address is set for a port, you can access it through the corresponding data register with data port 0 at hex 9F23 and port 1 at 9F24. The ports can be used independently of each other, but just seeing the registers doesn't really explain it. Instead, let's take a look at how these registers are actually used. For this case study, let's say we want to copy a single byte in VRAM from hex address 02468 
to 13579. If this was regular RAM, we could do this with a single load store pair. Even if it was between two different memory banks, it would still be trivial. But for VRAM, we need to set up the address registers for each location. To make it slightly cleaner, we use port 0 for the source address and port 1 for the destination. So first we need to define all the register addresses we are going to need, then the constants for the VRAM addresses. At start, we store 0 to Vera Control to specify data port 0. Then we store the source address into the three address registers. For bit 16, we use the caret to get the bank portion of the VRAM address, which would normally give you the highest 8 bits of a 24-bit value. But here there's only one bit above the bottom 16, so that's what the caret gives you. The remaining 16 bits are accessed with the angle braces, as in regular 16-bit values. To set up port 1, we write a 1 to Vera Control and store the destination address in the three address registers. Finally, with both ports set up with the required addresses, we can do the copy with a simple load from data port 0 and a store to data port 1. I know this seems like a lot of code to just copy a single byte, but the reality is that this is not a common use case. Generally, you are copying arrays of data, and usually between regular memory and VRAM, so only one port is needed. Either way, striding is what makes it efficient. As we saw earlier, the address bank register has its upper bits dedicated to defining the stride. In the case study we just saw, the stride was set to zero, which means that the data port will always be fixed to the specified address, no matter how many times you read or write to it. Most of the time, we want to access other addresses on subsequent loads or stores with the data register. This is done automatically by setting a stride value in the upper four bits of the bank register, and then specifying a direction in bit 3. If bit 3 is set, then the address is decremented by the stride value, otherwise it is incremented. The stride value, meanwhile, is only an identifier. The number of bytes advanced is shown in the table here. For most values, the stride size is 2 to the power of the value minus 1, meaning that a stride value of 1 will be 2 to the 0 power, which of course is just 1. Then 2 is 2 to the first power, which comes back around to 2. 3 gets you 2 to the second, which is 4, and so on. Hex A is decimal 10, so its stride size is 2 to the 9th, which is 512 bytes, and that's the highest power of 2 that makes sense to use. Higher stride values are based on screen geometry, starting with 40 at hex B and doubling all the way to 640 at hex F. In later episodes, we'll see use cases for most of these, but for now, let's look at what a stride of 2 can do for us. Let's say we have an array that we want to write to even addresses starting at the very top of VRAM, address 0. Our array has 5 bytes, so we want them to be written to even addresses from 0 through 8, while leaving the odd addresses from 1 through 7 alone. Using a stride of 2 will do exactly this. So we set the upper nibble of the bank register to 2, and then 0 to everything else, as that's what we have specified as the destination address. Then we start a loop by initializing x to 0, and then using it to index into the array. After each indexed load, we store the byte to the data port, and increment x until we get to the length of the array, which we calculate with the assembler using the start label minus the array label. The whole array is written to VRAM once we fall out of the loop. But what does that mean for Vera? Um, so what just happened? The values we wrote didn't look like Petsky or even ASCII codes, so why did they spell hello? And why altogether in magenta with no space between the letters? The answer lies in how Vera handles the display configuration. Vera supports two graphic layers plus 128 free-floating sprites. By default, only layer 1 is enabled, so bit 5 is set in the Display Composer video register at hex 9F29. This is where all the text and Petsky graphics you see in the boot screen are placed. Also in the video register is the current output mode, which is set to VGA by default. You could also use this register to disable the chroma signal of the NTSC output to get a black and white signal. And bit 7 is a read-only indicator to let you know which field is being scanned when in interlaced mode. 
We've seen the horizontal and vertical scale registers before, and how their default value of 128 means that the display is at a full 640 by 480 scale. Each layer has its own set of configuration registers, starting with the main config register, which is at hex 9F2D for layer 0 and 9F34 for layer 1. Of course, only layer 1 is enabled by default, so only the layer 1 registers are populated by default. For the main config register, it is set to hex 60, which means that the tile map is set to 128 by 64. This will provide the 80 by 60 text map we've seen on the screen, with some overscan that is hidden to the right and below the screen. The X16 has layer 1 in 16 color text mode by default, which means the T256 bit is clear, and the color depth value is 0, which means 1 bit per pixel. We'll see in later episodes how to change a layer to use tiles of different color depths and maps of different dimensions. Each layer needs a part of VRAM to store what is going to be seen on the screen at any time, and this is what the map base register is for. By default, the layer 1 map base at hex 9F35 is set to 0, meaning the text that is rendered on the screen is specified in VRAM starting at address 0, just like we poked at in our last case study. Of course, this is only an 8-bit register and it needs to store a 17-bit address. This is done by only specifying bits 16 through 9. The lower 9 bits of the starting address need to be 0. In other words, the map needs to be aligned to 512-byte boundaries. You can't just start it at any arbitrary address. The graphics that get rendered on screen based on that map need to be defined elsewhere in VRAM specified by the tile base register, which is hex 9F36 for layer 1. This register specifies bits 16 through 11 of the address, followed by two bits to indicate the height and width of each tile. As the Petsky glyphs are 8x8 tiles, both of these lower two bits are 0, meaning that the tile base address is effectively shifted 9 bits just like the map base. The default value for layer 1 is hex 7C, which comes out to hex address 0F800 when shifted 9 bits back to the left. Because those 2 bits are needed to indicate the tile dimensions, the lower 11 bits of the tile base address needs to be 0, which is a 2 kilobyte alignment. Unlike the map base, the tile base is not fixed in size. It is only limited by the number of bits used for the tile index in the map. For text, that's 8 bits, meaning 256 different text glyphs can be defined. For graphical tiles with more than one bit color depth, the index size goes up to 10 bits, meaning you can have up to 1,024 different tiles at your disposal. Of course, that all depends on available VRAM and the color depth and size of your tiles, as 1,024 8-bit color 16 by 16 tiles is 256 kilobytes, which is more than twice the total available VRAM. We'll get into that math more in later episodes on graphics. For now, let's just take a closer look at text layers. As we saw earlier, layer 1 is set to 128 by 64 character tiles by default, even though the display only shows 80 by 60 characters. If you could see beyond that 80 by 60 rectangle, you would see random garbage, as shown from this composited screen cap. Vera allows you to scroll tile and text layers, so if you were to scroll layer 1 right after startup, this is what you would see. Not exactly this garbage, but actual random garbage, and even the emulator has new random garbage each time it boots. The basic ROM only initializes the visible part of the map to make the background all blue and most of the text white, with the exception of the X16 butterfly logo, which has multiple colors of Petsky graphic characters. Everything else is left as is, meaning random screen codes and random foreground and background colors. So that's what fills up the logical 1024 by 512 pixel layer beyond the visible 640 by 480. And this configuration specifies that the default Petsky graphics characters will populate it. And the map will start at the very beginning of VRAM and extend to hex 03FFF meaning that you can use VRAM starting at hex 04000 for some other stuff. But first, let's take a look at how this map's contents are defined. When we did the striding case study, we were writing screen codes to even VRAM addresses starting at 0, 
which we now know as the beginning of the layer 1 map. For letter characters, screen codes aren't the same as Petsky or ASCII codes. Instead, screen codes start at 0 with the at symbol, which is normally hex 40 in Petsky and ASCII, and is then followed by the capital letters when using the default graphical Petsky character set. So A is 1, B is 2, and so on, which is what makes the array 8, 5, 12, 12, 15 come out to H-E-L-L-O. You can see here the full default upper graphics character set that contains the full set of Petsky graphics characters, but no lowercase letters, all shown in order of their screen codes. The X16 has two other character sets built into ROM, including the lower upper character set that is also a Petsky legacy set that replaces the uppercase letters with their lowercase counterparts and replaces some of the graphical characters with uppercase letters, starting at hex 41 which makes at least those screen codes the same as their Petsky or ASCII codes. The third character set is a new one created for the X16 based on the ISO 8859-1 standard, which has been used by many terminals as it provides support for most Western European languages with common diacritical marks and non-English letters. The ISO set finally provides full ASCII compatibility with the screen codes, and replaces the control codes with reverse video letters and a few special characters. Only the original Petsky sets devote the whole second half of themselves to reverse video, where setting bit 7 of a screen code will give you the reverse of the same glyph. The odd addresses that follow the screen codes specify the background and foreground colors of the character. 16 color text mode only uses the first 16 colors of the total 256 color palette which lets you express each color as a 4-bit value. Text starting with the initial basic prompt is white on blue, which translates to a color byte of hex 61, with 6 for the blue background and 1 for the white foreground. You can see the default 16 color palette here, but you can change those to be whatever 12-bit colors you want, as we will see soon. But first, let's take a final look at what our case study did. We now know that we stored screen codes for the letters in hello into the beginning of VRAM, skipping over the color bytes. By doing that, those color bytes following the screen codes still hold their original value, which was hex 64, or magenta on blue. Even though nothing but spaces were put between those upper wingtips, the color setting was kept rather than switching to white or to some other foreground color in between. This is why not only the H, but the rest of the letters all came out magenta but that was from writing screen codes directly into VRAM. What if we use the kernel to output Petsky codes as we have in previous lessons? The assembly code here would do that, and you will see that the array is different, with each value being larger by 64 because these are Petsky codes. Also, while it appears to be less code than the case study, it will take longer to execute because of the repeated calls to care out. And at the end, you will get white characters instead of magenta, because Careout fills in the color bytes with the current screen settings, which is white on blue after BASIC finishes booting. It will do this no matter where you plot the cursor, so at the very least, Careout is making two writes to VRAM for every character, and much of the time you don't need to change the color. So even if it may be more cumbersome to program, the performance is often much better when you write to VRAM directly. Also, at the bottom, you can see the Petsky code charts for both Petsky character sets, and you can see that while the control codes stay the same, the letters are completely different. The capital letters take up two separate areas, so you can have bit 7 set or cleared for uppercase letters, and it won't matter when you use a care out. But when you use screen codes to write to VRAM, each 8-bit code is different. You can just set bit 7 to make the character reversed, but with Careout, you need to first output the reverse control code and then output the regular Petsky codes. What you would use for a text-based application would have to depend on how you want it to behave and what kind of performance you need. Now let's look at the tile set. For text tiles, only 8 bytes is needed for each glyph, as it is 1 bit per pixel and they are 8 by 8 pixels so each byte represents a whole row of pixels. This means that the address for the glyph bitmap is the screen code times 8 plus the starting address of the tile set. 
By default, the layer 1 text tiles set starts at hex 0F800 in VRAM, taking up the last 2K of the VRAM zero bank. This may not be a convenient place to have it, so you may want to move the tile set if you want to use both Petsky text and have other graphic assets span across the two VRAM banks. We'll get into that kind of manipulation in a later episode. For now, we're going to keep it at 0F800, which means that the A glyph will be at 0F808, as its screen code is 1. Going to the end of the character set, screen code 255, which is a 2x2 two two checkerboard pattern, will be at hex 0F800 plus decimal 255 times 8, which comes out to be hex 0FFF8. Even with the text character sets that come from ROM, you can change the appearance of any tile once it is in VRAM, and we'll see how to do that soon. Right now, you can see how the bytes define the rows, with the set bits colored red to more easily see which pixels are going to be set to the foreground color. Simply writing to these bytes in VRAM will let you change these glyphs to look however you want. You aren't limited at all to what's present in the standard Petsky character set, but only to 256 characters of your choosing. We saw earlier what the default 16 color palette looks like, but here is the full default 256 color palette. Vera lets us only define one palette at a time for the whole system, and it has a fixed place in VRAM at hex 1FA00, which places it towards the end of bank 1, which is much more out of the way than the default character set. Each color entry is 2 bytes, meaning the palette only takes up 512 bytes, and only provides 12 bits to define each color. Consequently, 4 bits are wasted for each color entry, but nobody is crying out for those 128 bytes to be reclaimed. So, for each color, the green and blue components are set in the first byte, and the red component is set in the lower nibble of the second byte. This is effectively a little endian 16-bit value, with a standard RGB order starting at bit 11. You could convert one of these values to a 24-bit color by multiplying each component by 17, which would be the same as doubling each nibble, so that a little endian entry of hex 23 followed by 01 could be expanded to the standard hex notation of hash 112233. If you were to convert a standard 24-bit RGB value to this 12-bit format, you could simply chop off the lower nibble of each color component. So a standard RGB notation of hash 456789 could be converted to hex 0468, which would be stored as little endian bytes 68 and 04. You can set any entry in the palette to any 12-bit color you want, but the first color index 0 is special. By default it is black, and that's what it will look like by default when rendered on a single layer. But it is actually transparent, and the black you see is actually coming from the background, which is black by default and is not set in the palette. So you could change that first color entry to whatever you want, but it won't make any difference on the screen. In a later episode, we'll see how this palette can be chopped up into 16 different 16 color palettes. But for now, we are only dealing with text modes, and those can either use only the first 16 colors or all 256. We kind of skipped over layer 0 because it's not enabled by default, and all we've seen so far in any of these lessons is stuff in layer 1. Layer 0, when enabled, is rendered behind layer 1, meaning that it will only be visible when layer 1 is disabled, or through any pixels in layer 1 that are set to be transparent by using color index 0. If you have layer 0 initialized to be all non-black, any black pixels on layer 1 will not in fact be rendered as black, but whatever color is on layer 0. To get opaque black, you'll need to make another color entry black besides index 0. Layer 0 is scaled the same as layer 1, but otherwise it is completely independent and can be configured in any way, including as a tile map that can be scrolled independently of layer 1, making things like parallax effects easy to implement. For our example program in this lesson, we are going to create a text graphics demo using two layers. Layer 1 will be the same 16 color layer as before, but layer 0 will now exist as a 256 color text layer beneath it. It will also respond to the keyboard by changing the foreground and background colors of layer 1 text when number keys are pressed. 
It will also respond to certain letters, with I and O controlling zooming using the scale registers, R toggling the layer 1 character set between the default and an alternative set elsewhere in VRAM, S changing the at symbol to a smiley face emoji in the default character set, T and P toggling the visibility of layers 1 and 0 respectively, C changing color index 1 between white and black, and finally Q quitting the program. It seems like a lot, and this will be our longest example program to date, but doing each of these display changes requires very little code individually. So let's jump right into our text editor. After our perfunctory preamble of segments, we have the usual jump start, and then a whole bunch of constants and data. First, we define a zero page pointer for some indirect addressing, then all the VIR registers we are going to use, which line up with all the registers we saw earlier in the slides. Then we set up our VRAM memory map, starting with the default layer 1 map at the top, immediately followed by the layer 0 map at hex 0, 4000. Then we have a special location for the lower upper character set at hex 0, F1000, which will make it adjacent to the upper graphics character set in its default location at hex 0, F800. In between, we use an expression to define where the reverse video glyphs start in the lower upper character set, which will start with screen code 128. This way, if we relocate the beginning of this character set, we won't need to redefine this expression. It will just move along with it. Then near the end of VRAM, we have our fixed palette address. Then we define the register addresses for setting the ROM bank, and then the two ROM banks we will need, starting with bank 4 for the basic ROM, which is where we start and where we want to end up before returning to the basic prompt. Then we have the character set ROM in bank 6, which we'll use to copy the lower upper set to VRAM to have it and the default character set both available all the time. Our next constant defines where that set is located in ROM once we switch there. After that, we define the addresses of the kernel subroutines we are going to use, namely care out for outputting Petsky codes and get in for reading Petsky codes from the keyboard buffer. Then we have the Petsky codes that we will need to either read or write, and then finally a screen code mask for making characters reverse video. After all the constants, we define our global data in RAM starting with a variable to hold the current text color in layer 1, which is set to the default white on blue at load time. Then we have a smiley face glyph to be written to the character set when requested, written in binary to make it easier to see the pixels when I do a find for 1. Then we have a pair of strings, the first in all lowercase like we've seen all along, but then the second in all uppercase, which you may remember from a previous video to be a bad idea. In the demo of this program, we'll see why. At start, we clear the screen and make sure our text output color is white. Then we print out the two text lines with a couple of loops, starting with email, then onto the second line to print hidden, then a final return to move the cursor to the third line. So far, this should all be familiar if you've been watching the series. But then we get to the code that will copy the lower upper character set from ROM to VRAM. First, we need to switch the current ROM bank to the character set bank. Then we copy the starting address of the character set to our zero page pointer. To do the copy from ROM, we are going to make use of both data ports. First, we set up port 0 to copy the character glyphs in their original form to the beginning of the VRAM area we set with the VRAM lower cares address. We want a stride of 1 to not leave any gaps between the bytes we are copying. So we set the high nibble of the bank register to 1 by ORing hex 10 with the bank bit of VRAM lower characters. Then we put the high byte of that address in the high register, and then we just zero out the low register as we know this address must be aligned so that the entire low byte must be 0 anyway. Then we set up port 1 to start at the halfway point of where this character set is being placed in VRAM. This is because the reverse video characters aren't stored in ROM, so we'll need to invert the regular glyphs and write those to the second half of the character set. So we use a stride of 1 again and use the VRAM lower rev address as the starting point. To do the actual copy, we initialize the index registers with X set to 4 to count down the pages, and Y with 0 as that will be used for indexing into ROM. Each iteration of the loop starts with loading a byte from ROM, which will be a row of glyph pixels. We use the indirect index with Y mode to use our zero page pointer address. 
then we store the original row to data port 0, then invert it with an exclusive OR with hex FF, and store the reverse video row to data port 1. We increment Y to get to the next byte, but if Y comes back around to 0, we need to move on to the next page of ROM. To do this, we increment the high byte of the 0 page pointer, then decrement X. If X is not 0 yet, we have more to copy, so we go back to the top of the loop. When we fall out of the loop with X down to 0 and all four pages copied in both original and reverse video forms, we finish re by restoring the ROM bank to the basic bank so that we will be able to return to basic eventually. While we are keeping the default configuration of layer 1 at the beginning, we need to define a new configuration for layer 0. We set the config register to hex 68 which will set the layer to be 256 color text mode, also with the dimensions of 128 by 64. Then we set the map base to the address we specified earlier with VRAM layer 0 map. And then the tile base is set to the default upper graphics Petsky character set that is already in VRAM after boot, same as layer 1. To toggle color index 1 between black and white, we need to make sure that the palette is properly initialized in VRAM. While Vera is using the default palette already, the palette is not stored in VRAM on boot and will contain random garbage. Only when you write to the palette in VRAM will it change, and then what you have written will be readable. Since the only color we need to read is at index 1, we only need to set those two bytes. So we set up data port 0 to start at the third byte of the palette with a stride of 1. Then we write hex FF followed by hex 0F to maximize all three color components, which gives us white. Now to change it to black, we only need to flip these 12 bits to 0. We want to populate layer 0 with a visualization of the full 256 color palette. So we will do this with reverse video spaces in each of the colors of the palette, arranged in rows of 16. 256 color text is different from 16 color text in that there is only one color specified in the color byte, and it uses the full 8-bit color index. This will be for the foreground color, as the background color is fixed to color index 0, which is black on layer 0 or transparent on layer 1. But the reverse video space is just a square of all foreground, so within the 16 by 16 character square we populate, no black will be showing through between the colored squares. So to start, we need to set up data port 0 to start at the address we specified in VRAM layer 0 map. Then we load the accumulator with the screen code for a reverse video space, which will stay there as the loop that follows won't need to change it. We also initialize both index registers, X with 0 as that will be used to count up to 256, and Y with 16 as that will count down to the end of each row. At the start of the loop iteration, we store the screen code in A, followed by the color index in X. Then we increment X, and if it goes back around to 0, then all 256 colors have been used, so it's time to fall out of the loop to at check keyboard. Otherwise, we decrement Y, and if it's not down to 0 yet, we continue to the next iteration. When it does get down to 0, we know a row is complete, so we increment the high byte of the address to get to the next row, and zero out the low byte of the address to get back to the beginning of the row. This works because each row of this layer has 128 characters, with two bytes for each, so each row takes up 256 bytes of VRAM in the map. Of course, 256 is hex 100, so that's why we increment the high byte, and all rows start with addresses that have zero for the low byte. So after adjusting the address registers, we reset Y to 16 and continue to the next iteration. With the default state of both layers all set, we are ready to start the main loop of our program. We start with a call to get in to check the keyboard buffer. If it returns 0, the buffer is empty, so we keep calling get in until a non-zero Petsky code is placed in A. Once it happens, we first check to see if it's the 0 character. If its code is less than that value, it's not something we're looking for, so we ignore it and wait for the next keystroke. Otherwise, we compare it with the code that comes after the 9 character. If it is that or higher, the character is not a number, and we branch to at check C to see if it is one of the letters we are looking for. Otherwise, we know it's a number character, so we call the setColor subroutine 
then go back to wait for the next keystroke. We'll see how that subroutine works later, along with the rest that we are going to see in this loop. For now, we continue on to at check C, where we know the character is at least not a number. We compare it to the C character, and if it's not that, we branch to at check I. Otherwise, we call to toggle color 1 and then go back to wait for the next keystroke. At at check I, you guessed it, we check for the I character. And if it's not that, we branch to at check jump. Otherwise, we call zoom in and wait for the next keystroke. Finally, we get to at check jump, where we check to see if it's one of the remaining letters we are looking for. If it's less than the O character, we go back. If it's greater than the T character, we go back. But if it's in between, then we know it's in the range of letters that are all used by this program. So rather than have a bunch more compares and branches, we'll use a jump table. We could have done a big jump table for the whole character set, but that would have been unwieldy. So we keep it to this stretch of letters. To calculate the index into this jump table, we need to subtract the Petsky code for O so that the value in A will be in the range of 0 to 5. But since the addresses in the jump table will be 16-bit, we need to multiply that index by 2 with a simple arithmetic shift left. Then we transfer this index to the X register and do an indexed indirect jump to one of the addresses in the jump table. If X is 0, the letter pressed was O, so we jump to at zoom out. If X is 2, then the letter pressed was P, so we jump to at toggle layer 0. And so on through the jump table, we go straight to at return if Q was pressed, meaning the program will quit. We go to at toggle care set for R, at make smile for S, and at toggle layer 1 for T. Below the jump table, we find all the targets, starting with at zoom out, which will call the zoom out subroutine and then go back for the next keystroke. The same pattern continues to call toggle layer 0, toggle layer 1, toggle care set, and make smile. Finally, at return simply returns back to the basic prompt without going back for the keyboard buffer again. Now let's take a look at those subroutines. The set color subroutine is called when a number key is pressed. If it was 0 or 6 through 9, then we set the background color. Otherwise, we set the foreground color. In all cases, we use the number itself to determine the color index to be set. For background colors, we want the number to be in the high nibble, so we simply shift it 4 bits to the left, then transfer it to Y to save it. Then we load the current value of text colors and clear out the high nibble with an AND with hex 0F. We continue to at set colors where we store A back to text colors, then transfer the new color index from Y back to A. Then we do an OR with text colors to set the index in the clear nibble and branch to at start. If we are setting the foreground color, we need the number to be in the low nibble, so we just clear out the high nibble with an AND and with hex 0F and transfer the number to Y. Then we load text colors into A and clear out the low nibble by ANDing with hex F0, then branching back to at set colors where that same code will assemble the new text colors value just the same as it did in the previous case. Finally, we end up at at start, where we can begin filling in the color bytes for the first two rows with the new value we calculated. So we want to start with the second byte of the layer 1 map, and use a stride of 2 so that we leave the screen codes alone and only touch the color bytes. Once we have the address set, we initialize x to 0 and enter the loop, where we simply have to store the new color byte in y to data port 0, then increment x. Once we have gone through 256 iterations, x will come back around to 0, and we know that the first two rows have been updated, so we're done. Until then, we keep looping around and incrementing x until we finally fall out of the loop and return. The next subroutine is zoom in, which is called when i is pressed. We simply read the current value of the horizontal scale, and if it's down to 1, we have no further to zoom, so we just return. Otherwise, we divide both scale values by 2 with a simple logical shift right on each register, then return. We call zoom out when O is pressed, and here we check to see if the current scale is maxed out at 128. If it is, we just return. Otherwise, we multiply both scale values by 2 with a simple arithmetic shift left of each register, then return. When C is pressed, we call toggle color 1, which needs to flip the bits of color index 1 in the palette. So we need to set up data port 0 to start with the third byte of the palette, 
but with a stride of 0 so that we can read and write to the port without changing the address. We load the first byte, which will contain both the green and blue components, so we just flip all the bits with an exclusive OR with hex FF. Then we store it right back through the data port as the address hasn't changed thanks to the zero stride. But now we need to move on to the next address, so we increment the address to get the red component. We do this on just the low byte because we know that this won't put us on a new page of VRAM. We load the red component in from the data port and flip its bits with another exclusive OR, but this time we only need to flip the lower nibble, so hex 0F will work just fine. Then we store that back and the color is completely changed and we can return. When P for palette is pressed, toggle layer 0 is called, which simply flips bit 4 of the DC video register, which will enable or disable layer 0. T for text will result in a call to toggle layer 1, and there we flip bit 5 of DC video to enable or disable layer 1. We call toggle care set when R is pressed, so we want to switch the character set that the layer 1 tile base is pointing to. First we check to see if it is currently the upper graphics Petsky set. If it is, we change it to the lower upper set by loading the VRAM lower cares address shifted to the right by 9 bits to fit in the tile base register. Otherwise, we change it back to the default Petsky character set by storing VRAM Petsky there. Finally, make smile is called when S for smile is pressed. Here we want to point data port 0 to the start of the default Petsky character set with a stride of 1, so that we can copy all 8 bytes of the smile array to the first 8 bytes of the character set to completely overwrite the at symbol glyph with our happy little smiley face. So with the VRAM address set, we initialize x to 0 and go into the loop. We load a byte from smile and store it into data port 0, then increment x. If it has reached 8, then we know the whole smiley face glyph has been written to VRAM and we can fall out of the loop and return. Of course, we have a build script and uh, that will assemble vera.asm into vera.prg. So let's go to the terminal and do it. Let's call build.sh and then we'll see vera.prg is uh, right there in our directory. Okay, so uh, let's run our emulator. And we'll maximize that to get a better look at things. Okay, let's load vera.prg and run it. Now we see those two lines we printed out using the kernel. As expected, the second line is a bunch of graphical gibberish because we used ASCII capital letters in our source code. So let's see what happens when we switch to the lower upper character set by pressing R. Ooh, we can now see our secret message. In fact, the letter cases all match the ASCII source. This is why you may want to switch to this character set for some text-based apps if you don't plan on using all the graphical characters. Another R, and we go back to the default. Let's get a closer look by hitting I to zoom in. As you can see, each time I hit it, it doubles in zoom level until we can't even fit a whole character in the display. Oh, so uh, let's step it back a bit by hitting O to zoom out. Ah, this looks good, with the email address filling up the width of the display. So it's a good time to get rid of that boring old at symbol and bring some joy to our program with a single keystroke. <laughs> yes, hitting S turns it into the smiley face, and this email address is a lot happier. Of course, that is only with the default character set, and if we hit R again, we can see that the at symbol in the lower upper is still set. I think we've seen enough of layer 1, so let's hit T to disable it. Ah, none more black. We have no layers enabled now, no sprites, nothing but the infinite darkness. So let's hit P to see that palette hiding in layer 0. Oh, very nice. But what's that garbage on the side? Ah, we only changed that square of 256 characters. The rest of the layer still has random garbage, but in 256 color text mode, 
This means that we will have an all black background and random colors and screen codes in the foreground. Let's zoom out one click with an O and now we can see more of the garbage surrounding our pretty little palette. Let's hit T again to bring back our text and there it is just how we left it but zoomed out since last time. As you can see layer 0 has completely disappeared but it's still there hiding underneath all the opaque pixels in layer 1. Let's change that by setting our background color to black by hitting 0. Yep, there it is, garbage and all, filling in the background of our first two lines. If we hit P again, layer 0 will be disabled, and now we can see the pure blackness behind layer 1. We can try each of the other colors by going through the numbers. We already have white text, so hitting 1 does nothing. But 2 will change it to red, then 3 gets us cyan, 4 gets us magenta, and 5 gets us green. Let's hit 1 again to go back to white text, and we can start trying other backgrounds, starting with the 6 that gets us trusty old blue. Then 7 gets us yellow, 8 orange, and 9 brown. With the white text for now, we can keep the foreground using index 1, but change that color to black by hitting C. Now this is an opaque black, which we can see by hitting P to re-enable layer 0, and nothing happens. But if we set the background to black by hitting 0, we can now see that the foreground is opaque black, sitting on top of the colors of layer 0. Hitting P again disables layer 0, and now we have black on black for those lines. Hitting C again will change color 1 back to white, and R brings us back our little smiley face. And that's everything this program can do, so let's quit by hitting Q. And uh, that's all we're going to do today. I hope you try running and playing with this program yourself and see how different display configurations work. Maybe add some new features or content. You should have enough tools at your disposal to do this now, so have fun. We'll get to some more advanced topics in later episodes and learn how to make some really fancy graphics with Vera. If you don't want to miss any episodes in the future, make sure you subscribe to my channel and click the bell to get notified when they come out. If this episode taught you anything, please click the like button. And if you have any questions, please put them in the comments and that can influence how future episodes are made. If you can't wait for the videos to go public, become a patron and get access to new videos as soon as possible, just like the folks you see here did on my Patreon page, which you will find linked in the description along with the GitHub repo containing all the materials for this tutorial series. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Bye bye!